Good evening. Welcome. My name is David Willits, Chair of the Science and Technology, and welcome to this online meeting. Today we're looking at how UK businesses emerge from the coronavirus with a particular focus on how global supply chains might be different. The last few months have seen a monumental effort by both companies and the government dealing with the short-term issues around the global shutdown. And now we want to look at how large companies find the new normal. What are the challenges, risks and benefits? Will we be able to move to a green recovery? What should government do to back business in this new phase? We've got three excellent speakers lined up and I will briefly introduce them uh, one by one in a moment. But first, just a quick word about the technology. Uh, if you want to make a point or ask a question during the discussion session, you just need to use the Q&A function by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Type your question and press enter. You can do this at any time. In fact, during the three presentations is a, is a good moment to start thinking of your questions and putting them in. Um, you can also comment on other people's questions and upvote them. So uh, when we get to the Q&A session, the questions that have got the most votes are the ones that I, with my chairman's eye, will be particularly focusing on. Uh, now I'm going to turn to our first speaker, Juliet White. She is VP for Global External Sourcing in AstraZeneca. She joined the company in 1990 after graduating with a degree in psychology. She's held a number of HR roles in AstraZeneca uh, and took over the role of VP of Global External Sourcing in 2014. And that means that she has accountability for all AstraZeneca's externalized commercial supply chain. So she's working with more than 200 CMOs covering drug substance, drug product, packing, device manufacturing. Uh, she is also leading AstraZeneca's Brexit preparations for the supply chain. Uh, so uh, Juliet, over to you. Thank you very much, um, David, and thank you and uh, hello to all of you and thank you for the opportunity um, to uh, speak this evening. I recognise when you see our pictures, there are pre-lockdown haircut pictures um, and I'm sure we will all uh, not quite live up to the expectations. Um, I've got about 10 minutes and what I thought would be really helpful to do is cover off three key items. Um, and one of the things I, I wanted to reflect on, as David shared with you, um, I have the accountability for all of our externalized supply chains within AstraZeneca um, and have spent a significant proportion of the last 30 years working in supply chain. So it's something I feel passionate about. And I think my reflection, if we look through the Brexit period, is that actually the preparations for Brexit has showed us that supply chain can genuinely be a commercial advantage for a company, but also a country. And viewing supply chains as strategic opportunities, not taps that you turn on and off, are something that we can leverage for healthcare more broadly, but also the economy. Let me start by telling you a little bit about AstraZeneca in the UK um, and tell you a bit about what we do. And then I can talk globally in terms of our supply chains and then reflect on the question about, so what does COVID mean and what is gonna be the new normal for supply chains and how do we build resilience? So within the UK in AstraZeneca, we're a life sciences company where you can see the full end to end. So from true innovative discovery through to development manufacturing and commercial manufacturing, ultimately to then being able to touch the patients. We employ about eight and a half thousand people in the UK. But as with the life sciences, what you see is significant value creation of jobs that come. And there's probably jobs that occur as a result of our presence here in the UK. Our locations predominantly are Cambridge in the kind of golden triangle for science innovation and then in the northwest where we see strong capability in an ecosystem around development innovation and the ability to really commercialize at scale products. We contribute about 1% of the UK exports and as with pharma, um, pharma is about sort of 24% um, export comes from AstraZeneca and a real significant investor in R&D here in the UK. If I look at our global supply chains, um, we have 26 sites present in 16 countries. Um, but then, as David said, we have a very 
extensive external network that we need to pull on to ensure that we firstly have an agile um, secondly, we have a robust and thirdly, we have a responsive supply chain network that creates about 25 billion tablets annually and a one, about 1 1.4 billion finished packs. Ultimately, all of those pass through to patients and we have a kind of complex external network um, and that network ensures that we are present in a number of countries, but not over dependent on either one location or one economy. We're very externalized through our drug substance, so that's our kind of active pharmaceutical ingredient, but we source heavily in Europe, the US, and much less so in China and India. And my reflection over the last few months is that COVID has really illustrated that there is absolutely nothing more important than the ability to supply life-changing medicines to patients. Every single one of us takes a drug in the belief that that drug will do what it says, but importantly, it will be there when we need it. So ensuring that supply chains can withstand and tolerate interruption at a global scale that we have seen through COVID is absolutely critical. I think the other reflection is that manufacturing of pharmaceutical products has probably, and rightly and properly so, been one of the most resilient supply chains through the recent four to five months. Um, and whilst there is always a level of stockpiling, so you can build and you can hold some inventory, what we have needed is supply chains that have been able to be fast and responsive, as we've seen surge demand to secure patient requirements and needs, but also quite rightly and properly countries that want to stockpile an additional level of inventory to make sure that their patients in whatever territory they are can be met by medicines in an ongoing way. Strangely, the planning that we did for Brexit has helped us, um, and it's helped us in three fundamental ways. One is that it built additional resilience into the supply chain. And what I mean specifically about doing that is it means that as you plan for Brexit and you have to assume the worst and no deal Brexit, you stress test your supply chains and you ensure that they are as tight as the weakest link within them, whether that's your internal assets or your external assets. Secondly, it meant that we reviewed all of our levels of inventory so that we created that little bit of additional buffer. There is always buffer in pharmaceutical supply chains, but the additional buffer to make sure that we could protect patients. Thirdly and importantly, we looked at new routes for dispatching medicines. And those things we came to pull upon as we saw during the COVID crisis. And as we emerge from that COVID crisis, we need to look at our new normal. I think it would be very fair to say that the pharmaceutical industry has worked extensively with the government here in the UK during the past four to five months, probably never more so. Um, and I do believe that our collaboration with the government, with the NHS, has really enabled um, a tapping into an extensive global supply chain to be able to source materials that might have gone on short supply in one location to pull them into another. I do think now, though, as we come out of this immediate preservation of life and, and crisis period, we need to look at what do we make sure that we do to ensure that we've got a really strong and vibrant life sciences sector in the UK and one that's underpinned by having strong and firm supply chains. And in my view, that needs to be a good and sensible blend of onshoring, which should be done in cases sensitively, but also recognise that we are a global business and we're in a global industry. And actually what we want to see is the entire global economy to be able to recover. Therefore, our future strategy and supply chains need to ensure that we don't just flip to a rapid onshoring, but we actually have a sensitive mix where our global supply chains can be resilient against future pandemics or indeed other large scale business interruptions. And that means that we can't be over reliant on any one territory. In simple terms, we need to make sure that we've got a complex network which can flex up and down and can respond when events occur in one location and you need to be able to take over in another location. Simply means this is that we need to dual source many of our key products so that you're not reliant on a single point of failure and that that sourcing strategy carries both additional and proper levels of inventory, it has resilience built into it, but it has the ability to move from one source to another. I do think that there is an opportunity where the UK can really strengthen itself as we move forward. 
cutting edge uh, medicines, cutting edge device manufacturing is a great domestic capability, but it's a capability which isn't purely for patients here in the UK, it's a capability that creates extraordinarily valuable export as well. So I would very much like, um, and as we are doing, to continue to work with all parties to ensure that what we do in industries, we identify where there are gaps, that we work responsibly on those gaps, that we do have some risk sharing in building national capabilities. We have got some fantastic example of really cutting edge capability here in the UK, whether it's the Medicines Manufacturing Innovation Centre in Glasgow, or the Vaccines Manufacturing Innovation Centre in Harwell. Those are really good examples of where industry and government can work in partnership to do two things. It can build great innovation and resilience within the UK for the UK, but it can also create real value that we're able to export on behalf of the UK. So with that, David, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Juliet. Fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure we will uh, ask you to come back to that fascinating question of exactly how much onshoring we might expect and where governments should be deliberately aiming to promote national capabilities um, and where they should continue to rely on global supply lines. That is the hot question and coronavirus has really raised that issue. It's fascinating and important. Uh, next, we're turning to our second speaker, Professor Jenny Ko. She is the founder and director of the Advanced Resource Efficiency Centre uh, and head of communication partnership and internationalisation at the Energy Institute at the University of Sheffield. She is an advisor on the board of diverse organisations, and her work is about understanding and resolution of complex supply chains using interdisciplinary approaches. She is recognised as a world leading expert. Uh, with uh, both because of the scientific novelty and her work and also because it's generated significant impact for societies. So I very much welcome Professor Lenny Coe to give her presentation. Lenny, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Supply chain post COVID-19 is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, as a result of the experience uh, from the COVID-19 situation, where organizations and industry across industry have to adapt to respond to this challenge, uh, really is an eye-opening experience for all different types of supply chain. So I will talk about the prioritization for future supply chains, stability, security, sustainability and resilience needed in order to prepare for the recovery of the supply chain for the UK. Next slide, please, Angela. Just to give a bit of a background information about the uncertainty uh, of the whole economy. So COVID-19 situation actually is not um, a very small uh, situation as compared to the economic downturn uh, as a result of Brexit uh, or 9-11 or the financial crisis in 2007. As you can see from this graph, uh, the World Uncertainty Index uh, is very much at the high point for the COVID-19 uh, prediction uh, in year 2020. So this year is really extraordinary. So I've been drawing upon some statistics and forecasts uh, carried out by the European Economic Forecast Report in spring 2020 to look at some of the numbers for some of the major economies in the world. Next, please, Angela. So if we look at these graphs, so the one on the left really depict uh, the GDP and the growth situation in the UK. So if, if you focus on the right-hand side on the forecast scenario of 2020 and the prediction for 2021, you can see the situation for 2020 is not looking really good. And we know why that is the case. That is because of the lockdown, uh, a lot of situation uh, has actually uh, resulted in unemployment and businesses are not able uh, to um, do um, their normal activities. But obviously with the situation of COVID-19 
uh, is turning around uh, to a more positive trajectory at the moment. So we are all now preparing and looking forward to the economy recovery. So the prediction for 2021 economy is looking much better than this year. If we compare the UK economic situation uh, to the US economic situation this year and next year, and also against the China situation this year and next year, you can clearly see uh, that the impact is really tremendous. Next slide, please, Angela. Here are some of the numbers of the um, spring uh, 2020 forecasts. Um, what I would like to draw to your attention really uh, is most of the economy uh, in the world are experiencing negative growth uh, this year in the forecast. But um, China, although they have not um, provided a specific economic growth for this year, uh, but uh, according to this report, uh, there is a 1% increase uh, in the economic forecast for this year in China, which is very interesting. And next year, although the UK situation is not so good for this year, but for next year, the prediction for the growth is much, much better than the normal prediction pre-COVID-19 as compared to the numbers on the right-hand side uh, in the autumn 2019 forecast. So um, it is very interesting to see um, how the COVID-19 actually stimulated the economy. Uh, as a result of COVID-19, uh, a lot of QE, quantitative easing, major interventions uh, from all angles have been pouring into the economy across different sectors to pump the economies really back uh, to the normal situation or even actually make it even better. So I think um, these are some of the reasons why uh, in 2021, 20, the economic situation will be much, much better than this year. Next slide, please, Angela. So just to give you a bit of a summary uh, from the previous forecast. So the US economy really is expected to contract by two and a, uh, two, two uh, 6.5% in this year. Uh, but next year, it's just rebound back to 5%. But the Chinese economy growth for this year is 1%. But next year, it will go back to 8%. Uh, which is um, a, a positive sign. But for this year, the supply chain disruption as a result of COVID-19 have made a major disruption to the whole supply chain um, as a result of that massive drop in terms of its ex import, uh, export by more than 10%. But the UK situation um, for, for next year is 6%, which is actually a very positive number. Uh, but for this year, it is um, drop at a drop of 8.3%. Uh, but if we look at the EU uh, economic block, um, the situation for this year is 7.5% in terms of its, its economic growth. But for next year, it's only 6%. So the, actually, the UK economy uh, next year is going to be go, going hand in hand uh, with the Europe economy in terms of this forecast of growth for next year. That's quite interesting, given uh, the Brexit situation that we're experiencing and the focus of globalizing the entire supply chain and economy for Great Britain. Next slide, please. So what should we do in terms of planning for the recovery of the supply chain and the economy in the UK? So from the uh, COVID-19 experiences, uh, we can see a lot, of, a lot of real cases and real example of how businesses actually adapt their operations and supply chains uh, to respond to the sudden increase of certain demand, like masks, uh, ventilators, uh, and other products. Um, so we can see there is a level of resilience in our existing supply chain to be able to respond to increased need. But the question is, can we make this a norm? Can we make use of resources more efficiently? Uh, can we respond to this need even much better in the future? therefore minimizing any significant disruption and impact by learning lessons from this COVID-19. But at the same time, although there are very positive signs in terms of how businesses respond to COVID-19, there are also some uh, lessons learned uh, in this situation, such as fragmentation and shortages in our supply chain that we experience, for example, food supply chain on certain key items. And uh, this is usually uh, caused by inefficient resource management at inventory management, in inventory management uh, in a global supply chain, whereby we have to rely a lot on import. And when disruptions occur uh, in this sort of situation, 
it is really having a huge knock-on effect on our supply chain. So without designing a strong and resilient supply chain, and without knowing the important and the critical resources in our supply chain, it is very, very difficult to be able to, to, be able to plan ahead. So to plan for the reco recovery uh, in our economy, it is absolutely key that we need to understand uh, our critical supply chain, our critical resources, to be able to plan the response accordingly. Next slide, please, Angela. So uh, mapping this across to the recovery plan, uh, it is important to actually link this uh, to the green economy uh, recovery. So there are a couple of key types of resources available, such as social capital, environmental capital, and economic capital. Uh, so my thought is without the need, without uh, capturing all of this capital, um, it will be very, very difficult to actually plan for the green recovery. So there is a need to actually look at all of this dimension, environmental dimension, social dimension, and economic dimension in planning for the recovery uh, of the supply chain and the economy. Next slide, please. So what are the critical resources and critical sectors we need to look at in order to plan for our uh, supply chain going forward? Um, materials and manufacturing would be key, energy, food, digital, telecom, transport, pharma, and medical sector. Uh, based on our recent experience, a lot of these um, sectors and supply chain really depend on critical resources. And they also depend on interrelationships of export and import uh, in the trade uh, network. So it is important to understand and making sure that resources that are critical in these sectors are protected. Next slide, please. UK is currently a net importer. So uh, using the uh, statistics that I retrieve, um, there is a net uh, export deficit uh, of 220 billion USD in last year. So there is a great opportunity uh, to plan for the rebound of the economy going forward for, from this point onward to look at increasing the types of export uh, of important capabilities that UK will be able to lead the world uh, in uh, this direction such as those medical devices for healthcare that uh, Julia has mentioned, uh, and also uh, across a number of different sectors. Next slide, please. Here are some of the important sectors, uh, which are the UK uh, top 10 imports. So um, a lot of this information will be a, a great uh, reference point uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the relevant uh, the, uh, data, but for export. Next slide, please. Uh, planning ahead for trading partnership, uh, existing uh, partners uh, are these top 15 countries, but going uh, forward, I think there are uh, consensus that needs to be made in order to prioritize uh, the international partnerships in key sectors going forward, especially those key sectors that I mentioned that will rely on critical resources in their supply chain. Next, please. So in the post-COVID-19 global supply chain situation, I think the key message here is re really looking for more collaboration and expansion in the supply chain rather than retraction uh, in order to get the economic bounce back and then get, getting more SMEs to be involved and sharing those resources going forward. Next slide, please, Angela. So um, there are specific future structure uh, in the supply chain uh, that I would like to recommend. So uh, it is important to keep uh, expanding uh, the global nature of the supply chain, but uh, recognizing that uh, having a global supply chain, a more multilateralism uh, aspect of the supply chain will uh, increase the stability, security, sustainability, and resilience in that supply chain that will also result in a better economic environment and social impact. But the regional uh, option uh, will be fine, However, uh, I think there is a risk associated to re, uh, stability because it depends on um, a relationship of a certain regional block. Uh, but uh, the national uh, level supply chain uh, will have similar structure, but it will tend to have lower economic impact as a result of limited uh, access to the local economy, but without being able to access to the global economy. But the local supply chain will improve uh, the environmental impact, therefore reducing the negative uh, that will lead to a positive impact on net zero, uh, but also uh, increasing the social impact as well. 
So I think going forward for the future, there will be a win-win-win situation of future supply chain that is more global, that will maximize environmental, economics, and social impact. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, that was uh, very uh, interesting, Lenny. Now we turn to Professor John Lofhead. Uh, he is the Chief Science Advisor for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BAEF. Uh, he is the uh, as a director, sorry, I'm just going to turn on my video. Yeah. Uh, so John is the one of the director generals in the department, providing independent technical and scientific advice to ministers. And in the summer of 2019, he was also appointed chair of the Mission Innovation Steering Committee, which is a primary intergovernmental forum to progress clean energy innovation launched at COP21 in Paris. Uh, his professional career has been predominantly in industrial research and development for the electronics and electrical power industries. Uh, and he is a chartered engineer having graduated in mechanical engineering from Imperial College London where he spent five years in computational fluid dynamics research. Uh, John, thank you very much for joining us. We know you're very busy and we very much look forward to your observations. Over to you. Thank you very much, David, and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, taking time out to uh, come and listen to us uh, today. Uh, we've heard two excellent presentations, and uh, I know that Q&A is important, so I'm going to try and keep my presentation quite uh, short and, and give you my take, and I emphasize this is my take, on uh, the subject that we're discussing. I think the first thing that's already been referenced is that the UK has now for several years uh, run a very open economy and as a result we've enjoyed the benefits of a very efficient just-in-time method of supply for much of our economic activity which has been optimized on operating cost and economic cost. Uh, what we've seen is that during the crisis that we've been through over the last few months, uh, this has demonstrated certain shortcomings uh, in terms of its resilience during a time of great difficulty and disruption uh, everywhere. So as a result of that, I think we have seen quite clearly, and we've heard earlier, the increased recognition by many companies and organizations of the importance of resilience in their supply chains and particularly resilience to unexpected situations and therefore the need to consider more carefully uh, their own operating practices and processes as a way of seeing what might be done to increase uh, resilience. If you're considering the importance of resilience in your supply chain, then the nature of the chain that you wish to develop, as we heard from Juliet, uh, changes in a number of ways. Some of the responses that we've seen uh, have been in assessing the nature of the supply chain itself and the criticality of the products, services or inputs uh, that it deals with. And there is quite clearly a trade-off between resilience and efficiency and cost. And I think as we emerge from this crisis and move into a new, um, uh, a new way of operating, one of the things that we'll see is an increased dialogue about to what extent are we prepared to make those trade-offs in order to improve uh, the future efficiency. The second point that I would uh, also like to pick up, and, and Lenny touched upon this very briefly in her talk, is that the nature and resilience of the UK's infrastructure is critical in determining the nature of the supply chains that it will operate. And as we're witnessing tonight, this is not just about the physical infrastructure of ports, roads, railways, and air traffic, uh, but also the digital infrastructure uh, that we are finding we're increasingly using. I think that the experience of the last few months 
has advanced our application of digital technology uh, probably in a way that would previously have taken years to come about. And one of the implications of that is that we have seen very clearly a dramatic growth in e-commerce e uh, in the way that we uh, operate our economy. And that, as we go forward, will touch upon uh, the nature of our post-COVID business uh, quite a lot, because the development and adaptation and acceptation of that um, e-commerce approach will probably see a squeeze on the nature of some of particularly the retail uh, businesses that we, uh, that we are used to using and how they exploit the particular advantages that they've had in physical presence on high streets and similar things going forward. One of the other aspects of, of infrastructure is that uh, it's a declared objective of the current governments um, to look very much at a number of priorities for its activity. And beyond the recovery, this looks at particularly the achievement of the net zero goals for uh, our emissions, and also the process of leveling up uh, the economic activity of regions. By definition, leveling up will mean some different distribution of resources. And in itself, that different distribution of resources gives us the opportunity for greater regional capability in supply, which itself should potentially help resilience. We should note, of course, that regional disparities are generational in nature. They've not occurred overnight and it will be impossible to change them overnight. But the basis of what needs to be done to improve productivity and growth in that way has not changed. The third area that I think is important is that we have witnessed uh, quite clearly the enormous flexibility and adaptability that companies operating within the UK have shown within their existing processes uh, during the uh, difficulties of, of the last uh, few weeks. And I think that one of the things that that has shown by their actions is the value that can be achieved by doing things in a different way. We've seen, for instance, uh, additive manufacturing being applied at a much greater scale in order to enable organizations to move into very different areas in a very, very rapid and agile way. And that in itself was an approach to resilience that we saw. We also um, heard at the end of Lenny's talk, the issue about uh, green recovery. And as we look at a green recovery, which will inevitably involve doing many of the processes that we're used to within our economy in a different way, that will offer an opportunity for changes in processes and systems that could themselves be more resilient. The next thing that I'd like to touch upon is perhaps surprising, which is the influence of standards uh, in this process. Standards are important in all supply chains. And we saw uh, during the uh, search to supply PPE that some of the equipment sourced, uh, although described in a particular way, proved not to be uh, suitable to the kind of standards that were required uh, in a UK environment. And so as we look forward to potentially uh, driving different international standards uh, to go into a different nature of supply chain operating internationally as well as nationally, then there is an opportunity to think about how those standards can be developed in such a way that they will help to uh, improve the resilience of the process. And then finally, uh, I think one of the most important things uh, that I as an engineer and uh, somebody from the R&D space uh, believes in naturally is that as we uh, go forward with a declared intent to focus on supporting R&D to a, to a greater level than has been the case for the last few years, that that process 
of introduction of new technology will itself uh, enable us by supporting the development of new sectors as well as the, the evolution of existing business sectors means that we will have a great opportunity to be able to uh, apply our technological capability with an eye on the resilience of our activity uh, more perhaps than we did in the past. So uh, I'll stop there, David. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. That was very helpful, John, and uh, much appreciated. We've been getting some Q&A coming in, and I'm going to be ruthless in how I prioritize. I have to say to Lenny that her, the first part of her presentation sparked quite a lively reaction about her economic forecasts. Um, and some people thought they were optimistic. But I'm, as, as we're really trying to focus on supply chains and resilience, I'm going to leave that hanging for the time being because we could spend um, the rest of the session debating what we think is going to happen to uh, our British GDP over the next 12 months. Instead, I would like to turn to Juliet because, again, John, in his presentation, identified the crucial question, how much is it worth paying if it's extra cost for national resilience? And we've had a question from Dougal Goodman, which is absolutely about this. His question, he says, 100% resilience is not possible. Increasing resilience goes hand in hand with increased costs. Does AstraZeneca have an internal process to agree at what level of resilience uh, that is acceptable. And uh, I know, and John might want to comment on this as well, ministers have been confronting questions like, how much should we spend on promoting a UK industrial capacity in testing? How much does it matter and how much is it worth paying a higher price to have uh, PPE manufactured in the UK? They took a, took a clear decision, it was already in the planning chain, that it was worth having um, extra vaccine manufacturing capability in the UK. That is a a tough financial decision and I think we'd be very interested Julia in hearing how the nitty-gritty of how AstraZeneca approach it. David thank you for um, the question so there's probably three things um, I would say in response firstly we always have to assess what's the cost of not having resilience and if the cost of not having resilience is an inability to meet patients with their medicines I would argue that's a cost that many of us are not prepared to take I think the second reflection I'd offer is that there is an assumption that the only route to resilience is to stockpile. And actually all three speakers have talked this evening about having flexible and more complex and interdependent supply chains build some of that resilience. Now building that additional capability and capacity doesn't always come at additional cost. Um, if you look to have a footprint which is broader, a footprint which operates in a number of markets and a footprint which can flex up and down depending on needs, actually you can find yourself in a position where you can optimize some of your costs because you're able to kind of flow um, against where you see price movement happening on a global, global scale. I think the third thing that I would say is, and any business will do the same, um, that we always look at what's the right balance between holding inventory, having really smart, effective and fast business continuity planning, and what actually is the likelihood of a need happening. Now, we're all emerging from a pandemic, which has made us all concerned and uncomfortable, but we have to look at both our ability to respond and our likelihood to respond or need to respond. And I think most companies will be no different from the one that I sit in, is that we routinely and regularly review that business continuity planning. We regularly look at the cost of being able to respond versus the likelihood of being able to respond. But certainly I can say after 30 years in, in the life sciences industry, the absolute kind of paramount is that it's unacceptable not to be able to supply a patient with their medicine. It's unacceptable reputationally and it's not the right thing to do. So you have to balance the cost of not having resilience, which often becomes more expensive in the long run than the ability to build agile resilience into your supply chains and design them for agility. Great. 
Thank you very much indeed, Juliet. I'm now going to turn to a, a couple of related questions, really for John Loffett, because John made the interesting point about standards and international standards. Uh, Celia Colcott is asking about how we get the balance right between standards and, of course, the endless danger that they will inhibit innovation and protect incumbents. Uh, and Judith Hackett has got a similar question to John. Uh, do, do you think we in the UK we over egg things? We need to be more flexible. And, and an aspect, as, as John was talking about the green economy and has particular responsibilities there, do you, John, envisage standards that include the carbon element of goods and indeed services being imported into the UK. One of the arguments is national measures of carbon mean that sometimes we have just offshored uh, dirty high carbon activities and appear to be more virtuous as a result. Uh, presumably you want a proper uh, system of carbon accounting around the world so that if a lot of coal has been burnt in order to produce the steel we import, that's factored in in some way. How do, how does, how do these standards work in future? So uh, perhaps I could uh, firstly apologize for not having my video on when I was talking. That was um, uh, an oversight on my part. Um, I, I'll, I'll answer the second part first, if, if I may, uh, with regard to really what's a, a question about the sustainability of supply chains and in particular the environmental sustainability of supply chains. And I think as we move forward, towards a much lower emission world, then it will be critical that we find a way of embedding sustainability in those supply chains. There is a challenge in doing that, and that is that it has proved extremely difficult to get reliable accounting of exactly what the environmental impact of different supplies has been. And I think, therefore, the question about standards is that one critical role that standards will play is in helping us to develop a, a means by which we can make reliable assessments of the supply chain impacts environmentally as we go forward through a, a, a good method of being able to quantify them. And as many of you will know, we've previously had two or three attempts at producing uh, what's called uh, consumer-based accounting of uh, of emissions uh, which have failed and that's why we currently have a geographically based system because we were not able to do it. So there is a need to develop standards. To go back to the first part of your answer about do standards inhibit uh, innovation then of course they can and I think we need to look at to what extent standards can be reliably uh, um, developed on an outcome basis for what they're doing in other words, the performance, functionality, and other aspects, as opposed to the more prescriptive base of saying, you know, it shall be a yellow wire and it shall be attached with a four millimeter bolt at this point. Um, and I think that there is enormous scope for innovation in this. And I know that a lot of the work that here in the UK, the BSI has been doing, is looking at how we can develop these more intelligent future-proof standards that will be required and the experience of the last few months I think will help to develop the driver for that. Great thank you very much John. Um, now Andy Sellers is participating in this webinar and Andy works at the compound semiconductor catapult and he's actually been working doing a wider exercise on the resilience of supply chains in the telecommunications industry um, we were hoping we might be able to hear Andy speak. He's put in a question as well, but instead of reading it out, I th uh, if Andy, we can get you online, you might like to put your question and any other observations drawing on your own recent work on this cross catapult exercise. Sure. Uh, uh, Andy, over to you if you are there. Thank you, Lord Willits. Can you hear, hear me okay? Yep, fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm Sellers from the Compound Semiconductor Applications Catapult. Um, so I chair a, a cross-catapult group that's looking at large challenges that we can address um, as a catapult, uh, you know, bringing the, the capability of the catapult network together. And one of those areas we've been looking at is resilient communications as a theme. 
Um, so we recognize that, uh, especially in lockdown, I think this brought it to, to sort of uh, to a head and to a real focus, our reliance on data communications in terms of Zoom and what have you. Um, uh, and this area has kind of uh, got a lot of, uh, a lot of interest from the, from the Cross Catapult Group. So in terms of resilience, we're looking at potential, you know, what sort of, what sort of threats are we worried about in resilience? Well, we're looking at potentially hostile threats like, uh, like denial of service attacks, but also things like environmental threats, such as an outage from an electrical storms or systemic threats, just the fact that the system is quite complex and requires regular maintenance. And this kind of really, uh, in order to uh, develop a resilient communication infrastructure, we really think that the UK ought to have some sovereign oversight uh, of, of, of what, we, what we are putting together. So we put in some evidence to the, uh, the Parliamentary Science and Technology Committee, um, which was really kind of looking at um, why doesn't the UK have an OEM in this space and what would it create, what would it require to get us to that position? That's a very big ask. It really is a very big ask. But I actually believe there are certain parts of our infrastructure which are more critical than others, where the UK really does have leading scientific and engineering knowledge, uh, where I think we could actually start to address that and we could develop an, expert, an exports proposition as well. I don't believe we can do this on our own. I think we need to partner with, with European partners, uh, North American partners, and perhaps uh, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand partners. But I really believe that this is something that we could get to a position where we have sovereign oversight of what, what it really is a, a, critical, uh, a critical asset of national importance. Um, so I'd just kind of be, I'd like to open that up as, a, as one of the things that I think we ought to be working on and, and considering. Yes, that is uh, very interesting. And I wonder, Lenny, yours was quite an optimistic interpretation of, uh, of a win-win scenario but actually one does detect these pressures basically to uh, make it much harder to have overseas takeovers of UK companies, uh, to invest much more in national capabilities, um, and basically, to put it crudely, to be less dependent on supply chains stretching out uh, abroad to, company, to countries like China. Uh, what do you think of that trend, Lenny, as described by Andy? Do you welcome it or are you worried about it? Um, thank you, David. And uh, Andy's question is very interesting. Um, yep, fine. It's very, very interesting. Um, I, this is certainly one of the things that is, uh, has been in my thought for a while, um, given the information uh, that, uh, that are surfacing around uh, on security on critical infrastructure. Um, so because over the years, I mean, this has not been just uh, happening over the last um, six months, uh, that uh, a lot of the critical uh, Im important innovation and research uh, activities that will fit into this particular supply chain or this sector uh, has not been well protected, for instance. Uh, therefore, it is um, um, this particular bill that Andis has mentioned will be critical, I think, in order to partner up with key uh, partners around the world. But um, what is important is to identify uh, who are the leaders in the field, and what particular technology we are talking about, uh, whether there is a manufacturing supply chain that are ready uh, in the UK or with the partners country that will be ready to pick up those uh, critical materials needed in order to produce the devices needed uh, in terms of the hardware, uh, in terms of the software, uh, whether we have continuous capability that can invest in skill uh, and uh, expertise needed uh, in-house uh, in the UK and partners country to invest more in research and development in this area. Uh, for example, on information security, cyber security, uh, on critical infrastructure and so on going forward. So yes, so I think this is one of the key issues, uh, but uh, just like many other supply chain, including energy supply chain, you know, it needs to be really looked into in terms of those critical rely reliance uh, on resources upstream in the supply chain. Um, so notwithstanding just on these particular uh, issues of uh, digital uh, infrastructure. Um, Thank you. And John, do you want to comment on this? Because you might well find, uh, well, as this uh, requirement for scrutinizing potential takeovers grows, and there's much more activity already than there was, I should imagine many of these issues come across your desk. What are the criteria? How are the criteria changing? You must be observing them. Uh, they're, they're very different from 12 months ago, and they could be very different in, again in 12 months' time. What are the trends here, and how are you operating? 
Well, um, could I uh, first of all say that I'm, I'm not really going to comment upon the government's policy in this area because that's not my job. Um, but what I would like to do is say, obviously, these questions are uh, questions that of which government is, is very conscious. Uh, but to go back to the point Andy raised as well, what I would like to say is that these are quite complex issues when you're talking about infrastructures and critical elements, because we're very, very rarely talking about a widget. We're these days talking in most cases about very complex systems and the development and management of the system itself is a considerable part of the value and the intellectual property that can be exploited. And it is usual within systems to look at multiple lines of supply uh, for any key component. So it's usually the case that these are decisions when we look at our own systems that, that build resilience into the decision. Can we be reliant upon a single part of supply? No, of course we can't. And equally, when we're looking at how best to exploit it, we probably need to recognize that we do so in an international world, inevitably with international partners. So finding the right uh, uh, path through that is, is quite challenging. In terms of takeovers of key companies, that's a, a government and a political decision uh, that, they, uh, that they take uh, using the criteria that they choose to apply at the time. Such a wise comment. <laughs> uh, I mean, an example I would add to the mix, uh, which I've been involved in wearing various hats, is planning for a, a British alternative to Galileo's British satellite system, where if you set at the beginning of your process the requirement that these be entirely British companies, you get a very different level of cost and a different timeline than if you say it's British and Five Eyes companies, or you say it's British and certain agreed continental partners, and it massively changes the costs and the timelines depending on that decision that you make. So these things really are uh, very important. Um, I think we should now turn back to an issue for Julia because we had a question from Carlos Lopez Gomez. Uh, which uh, I think we'd be interested to hear Julia's, Juliet's comment on. Uh, according to the WTA, trade in medicinal products described as critical and in severe shortage during the COVID-19 crisis accounted for 1.7% of world merchandise trade last year. Um, so should we make some distinction between the, I think he's implying that's actually quite a narrow specific thing. Um, could we distinguish between those critical medical supplies and the rest of manufacturing supply chains? Or perhaps as John was implying, are, we, are these supply chains now so complex that we would find the mutual dependence is much greater than that? Uh, again, you might, uh, Julia, give us your perspective from AstraZeneca. Yeah, so it's a very interesting question, Carlos. And I think I can only give you a perspective. I probably can't give you a definitive answer. Um, but there's a couple of things that I would say, firstly, the interdependency upstream in supply chains is often more complex than we think. Um, and many um, kind of raw chemicals actually share the same starting materials. Um, anyone who's a chemist will know if you go back, most things start with earth, fire and water in one way or another. Um, but actually many supply chains have a high level of complexity and interdependency. So I think there is an element of um, interwoven However, I think there is also an element of if you separate the difference between established generic medicine, which often comes at a lower cost and has often been a cost play for both governments and, and companies, and you have a look at innovation, which is slightly different. And I think that if we look down those supply chains, the further you get down the supply chain, you can see a level of separation. But the choice comes then down to, do you want to make a cost play? Because it's a heavily genericized product, and often that's what happens. Or are you more interested in making an innovation play where the ability to bear a higher level of cost often comes in? So I think the point that you're making, Carlos, is that there is a level of separation 
but often some of the things that go far up the supply chain share interdependency. Secondly, we often see some of the challenges aren't actually the materials themselves, but they come down in the ability to move those materials. And whether a material is an innovator product or a generic product, if it's crossing borders, it's usually traveling on the same transport. And in many cases, transport has become the things that can create kind of short term pinch points. It isn't purely access to the product itself. Thank you very much, Juliet. Uh, now, we've got five minutes before a hard stop at 7 p.m. So what I'm going to do is invite uh, John and then Lenny, if they have any final observations they want to make, then I hope there'll be time to come back for Juliet for a final comment. Um, but we have only got a minute for each of our speakers. Uh, John, you first. Thank you very much, David, and I, I promise I won't even take a minute. I think that today has highlighted some very important areas. I think this field of resilience of supply chains and more importantly, the nature of what our economic structure will be going forward, how businesses do uh, their operations, uh, and how they organize themselves will be something that will become of increasing importance as we develop. I don't think we have the answers to it yet, uh, but I think we're going to have a fascinating time working them out. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Lenny, I mean, again, very brief, let me press you again. Are you, uh, you seem an optimist. There is an argument that both the, preserve, the concerns about national capability shown up by this crisis, plus pressures to properly account for carbon use wherever it's happened in the world, this will throw globalization and global trade into reverse. Uh, tell us why you're so optimistic, and very briefly. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the world uh, will need uh, to work on an interdependency of a structure uh, of um, um, interdependency, in, interdependency in terms of resources. Um, and then um, the optimists, they come from uh, the, the, the nature uh, of our economic system, uh, the nature of where um, the, the world uh, is built upon. Um, and I think, you know, it is not um, a, a case of my personal view. I think this is where the economic model has been built uh, since uh, it was first started. Um, so I agree uh, very much in terms of John's uh, observation. Uh, the area of global supply chain uh, going forward is going to be fascinating, uh, especially linking this to the area of recovery uh, of uh, economy and especially related to the I idea of net zero uh, in the UK uh, in terms of green recovery and some of the key observation uh, and discussion made uh, today uh, on critical infrastructure and critical resources will be absolutely key going forward. Thanks, David. Thank you, uh, Lenny. Juliet, final very quick observation. Um, so I'll be 30 seconds. Um, as you would expect, I am passionate about resilient supply chains, passionate for the UK, but also on behalf of the UK. Excellent. Very good. Thank you very much, Juliet. Thank you to all three of our speakers. It's been a very topical discussion. These are real decisions that large companies are having to take and also national governments are having to take. Uh, and uh, so we bring that to a conclusion. There's just time to me to urge you to fill in our email survey following this event. It's always good to have feedback. And our next online event organized by the foundation will be on the 15th of July on the topic of science and politics how to bring them together and keep them apart. Speakers will include Professor Sir Mark Walpert, who will by then just have departed as Chief Executive of UKRI, and of course also a former government chief scientist, a Professor David King, a former government chief scientist, and Professor Angela McLean, Chief Science Advisor at the Ministry of Defense. So that is another great lineup of speakers. Uh, details of how to register for that event will be on our website tomorrow. Thank you all very much indeed for participating in this discussion and particular thanks to our three speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Bye.